You are listening to the Hiking Radio Network, where we talk the walk with shows by hikers about hikers for everybody. Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail, the ultimate midlife crisis. Join Steve and his guests every week as he staggers from Georgia to Maine. Hi guys and welcome back to the show. This is Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail, the ultimate midlife crisis, and I am Mighty Blue, or Steve Adams. Of course, I don't know how many of you are coping with this current coronavirus pandemic, but whatever you're doing, I hope you're staying safe and perhaps more important, you're keeping your family safe. I know there are still people out on the trail and hopefully that number is reducing day by day because, as you know, we aren't supposed to be out there right now. Mind you, I'd imagine that those of you who who are still out on the trail are about as socially distanced as you can possibly get. This is going to pass and I'm sure that everybody's itching to get out into nature again. If nothing else, this time of shutdown has probably caused people to reflect more on what is really important in their lives. For me, I've become even more of a loner, and I'm gutted because I was hoping to be hiking in Scotland in a few days' time, but that, of course, is now not possible. It's funny, when you're older, you realise how much this time is as a percentage of your remaining years. I can tell you, I've resolved not to waste so much time in the future. Actually, I've just noticed coming up on my screen as I'm recording this that the President is opening the national parks up again it being Earth Day, so who knows, maybe the ATC will put out something about the Appalachian Trail. And all that was really more than I wanted to say, so we'll just get on with it and I'll tell you about today's show. Our first guest is somebody who will be very important when we get back to a semblance of real life. It's Paul Curtin from the Carolina Mountain Club in Asheville. Paul did a thru-hike of the AT with his son, Kyle, in 2015, then moved to Asheville and now goes back to the trail as a trail maintainer with the Carolina Mountain Club. Paul is going to tell us about both his hike and the work that the club does for the AT and other trails. Paul will be along soon. Next up, we're going to have an old buddy back, Clay Bonneman Evans. Clay's been on the show before, and funnily enough, almost exactly a year ago, near the end of April 2019, he was hiking the AT with me for three days. Clay is on to talk about another trail, though, the Great Plains Trail, which is really in the early stages of its development. It's another long-distance trail that runs from Mexico to Canada. If you want solitude, this trail may well, may very well be the one for you. Clay will be along after Paul. Lastly, Grandma Gatewood's fame continues to spread and she is now being sought after by Sports Illustrated, of all things. So let's get on with it. Here is Paul Curtin, or Magnum. Today's guest was the suggestion of another of our listeners, Tom Weaver of the Carolina Mountain Club suggested that I should contact a guy named Paul Curtin, the AT supervisor for the club. So I did this, and this is Paul Curtin. Hi, Paul. How are you? I'm great, Steve. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. I'm good. And I'm going <laughs> to I'm gonna spare your blushes by reading out what Tom wrote about you. <laughs> he said that you threw height with your son in 2015, then you joined the club and you have, and I'm quoting from his email here, made incredible contributions to our trail maintenance efforts, including some creative ideas to bring new volunteers to our club. So before we get on with your own hike, tell us why you thought that it was important to join the club and to maintain that connection with the trail after you'd hiked to the AT. Well, you know, it's an opportunity to give back, Steve, and I'm sure if you've hiked the trail twice, you've been out there and you've seen maintainers out doing their work. Amazing, yeah. And um, so you see that, you know, it's just a, a great way to give back. Now, I didn't live in the area where I could help uh, immediately. I had to move from Ohio to North Carolina to do that, but um, uh, that wasn't the main reason I moved, of course, but uh, <laughs> it, did get, it did give me an opportunity to get out there and work on the Appalachian Trail and other trails that are clubs maintain. Yeah. And I think, you know, most of the people that want to come out and work on the trail, they do so because they, you know, feel a strong uh, need to give back. And, you know, in my role, I get emails all the time from people who have hiked the trail. And this is kind of a, a mecca for uh, long distance hikers, this Asheville area. Yes. And, uh, there's lots of through hikers around here. And I get emails all the time from people that have hiked the trail and say, I really want to give back. And, you know, this is a great way to do it. So I, I think that's the primary thing over time more reasons come to the fore and uh maybe it doesn't become the primary one but that's what uh motivated me to come out 
Yeah, it's very cool. And and I'm going to come back to the trail maintaining after we've spoken about your hike. Have you always been an outdoorsy type or was the AT an entirely new type of experience for you? You know, when we had our kids and they were young, we would go out, you know, camping on weekends. I've always been a runner, uh, more of a road runner, actually, right. but um, always done a lot of that kind of activity. Sure. And uh, as I got older, I, I did more hiking and started to do some backpacking. So I had a little bit of experience. I, ha- I had backpacked a little bit in the Smoky Mountains, uh, maybe three days, and I maybe had 10 days of total backpacking experience when I uh, set out on the trail. So not not too much, but I, I've always been outdoors and, and always very active. Yeah. So having been an outdoorsy sort of guy, did you learn about the AT quite young or was this just come onto your radar a bit later in life? Now, how did you learn about it? Well, um, I guess I've always known about it, of course, but I think the, the way you say I really that, about- You say that. I met several people acting in some <laughs> of the towns near the trail who had no idea there was such a thing. I'm it sure it's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess I'm a little more aware than that. But, uh, uh, you know, I read Bill Bryson's book. I was probably about 35, 40. And right. uh, as soon as I read that book, I it just that just planted a seed in my mind. That I've got to do that someday. That just sounds like such a great experience. Um, so I, I decided basically whenever I retired from work, I, I was going to set out and hike that trail. It was going to be the first thing I did. Funnily enough, though, I, I, I've read that I think three times. And I've heard Bryson read it himself, you know, uh, as an audio book, which is a great way to listen to it, actually. And I listened to it just before I went the second time, you know, last year. And uh, his journey was nothing like mine, either of my journeys, in fact. I got a funny feeling that, I mean, I love the book. I think he's an hilarious writer. And I know a lot of people don't particularly like the book. But it, it, to me, was nothing like the real AT experience. Was it for you? No, I I think, of course, he's exaggerating a lot. And he's... um, comes off as a hypochondriac kind of, so yes. got a little diff- different take on it. But, you know, when I read that, I knew he'd only hiked about 800 miles. Yeah. And as ill-prepared as he was and all this stuff that he encountered, it gave me a great deal of confidence that if he could make it that far, I probably could make it the whole way. Yes, yes. there is that, of course, yeah. And I know that you went uh, with your son. Was it his idea to join you, or did you want some company, or did it just kind of happen that way? Yeah, I'd always – plan to do it alone you know i asked my wife but she had no interest in that um right. which i which i understand but yeah he he had just gotten out of the army after serving for six years in uh, february of that year that i was going to go hike and uh he came back home after that time and he just said hey dad i'm going with you it wasn't really like i asked him of all course, right i welcome uh i welcome him to come but um yeah it was not planned at all it was totally uh happenstance um he, he basically came home about a month before I was going to take off, but he's in excellent condition. It was no problem for him. He, he, runs, sure. very, he runs very long races. Um, he runs 100 mile, 200 mile races. So it was it was no problem for him to hike the trail. But he just decided he wanted to do that, and in his time off the army between uh, then and when he was going back to school. So yeah, it worked out perfectly. I, I was really happy to have the companionship. Yeah, when we talked about this, uh, and I took some notes really about your trail maintaining more than anything else, you told me you'd written a blog, and um, and I and you kindly gave me access to the blog, and I, I've been reading some of it, which was really quite interesting actually. And I've been reading it, and something I I wonder if you recall your reasons for doing the AT, because I thought it was a really good idea to articulate before you actually hit the trail exactly what it was that you were doing and why. And I think that's quite a, quite an important thing to know why you do it. Do you remember what you what you wrote down? Yes, yeah, Steve. I, as I did my preparation work, you know, there's physical preparation, but there's also mental preparation. And um, you know, if you don't have a really strong reason to finish the trail, you know, I could tell from reading other people's, you know, uh, information from when they had set out. Uh, if you don't have a really strong motivation, it's tough to finish. And um, I agree. You know, I think. I always tell people when they come through our section, which is about 250 miles out from the start, sure. they're in it in it for two weeks, three weeks. And um, I always tell them, hey, if you've hiked up and down to this point, 250 miles, you've been out there for weeks, you've physically proven that you can finish the trail. But it's it's the mental challenge, you know, that's sure. really the, to what's going to get you across the finish line. So, so I wanted to set out and have some, have some uh, things in mind that wanted to help me through. Uh, one of the ones was – I had a friend that I had played soccer with in college and a really good buddy 
uh, he had died kind of prematurely yeah. and um, after college. And so we had set up a scholarship in his name and I wanted to try to pump up that scholarship. So I, I pledged that I would donate a thousand or a, a dollar per mile of my hike right. toward that scholarship. And I challenged all my college buddies and, and other friends to participate in that. And so that was one of the things was, if, you know, if I finished the hike, then I could raise hopefully, you know, fifteen twenty thousand $20,000 or something like that. Yeah. Did that work out? Yeah, it did. I think we raised about $20,000 at the end. Awesome. Um, That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I read that. Yeah. yeah. So that was one reason. Another one was to just make a mental break from work. I'd had a really kind of a high intensity job for, for a long time. And so I, I wanted to get a break and, um, you know, that's just to turn off the switch. Once you step out on that trail, you're in a whole different world. And that really helped too, because, you know, I, I didn't think about work for about one minute the whole time I was out there. Yeah. You know, what? I, when I read that and I, I thought that was the mo- not so much the most important, but it's the one that resonated with me so much You're making a clean break from the work world. Some people just retire and then perhaps they go on the trail or they don't go on the trail, whatever they do. Um, but to articulate that you wanted to make a clean break from the work world it just struck me as such a good idea. It just this is this is your almost your underlining of your work, wasn't it? Moving right. on to whatever you did next, yeah. And I really like like that, yeah. And there was a couple of other things. I, I'll, t- yeah. I'll tell you what there were. One was hiking with Kyle, which was important, right. obviously. Another was yeah. hiking with family and friends. Right. And the sixth sixth was to become an experienced backpacker and live in the outdoors. So, right. how was it for you? Did you was it harder than you thought, or pretty much as you'd imagine it would be? I don't think anybody who hasn't done it can imagine what it's really like. <laughs> I just don't think there's any way to put that in your mind. Yeah. You know, you might think, you know, but you really don't. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, it's much harder. Uh, it's harder physically and it's harder mentally. Uh, even if you're in good shape, you know, it wears you down over time. You do you, you build up and you get stronger in some ways and weaker in others. Yeah. And I felt like, um, you know, the trail was slowly bleeding me out as I, as I went along. Did you lose a lot of weight? You know, I stupidly made the decision that I was going to lose weight. And so I gained weight to start with. So that I would have something to lose. <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, then I was carrying all that extra weight up those hills in Georgia and I was regretting it instantly. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah I, I, I wound up probably from what I would say my base weight is, I probably lost about 10 pounds or something like that. But oh, we had to eat like crazy. We were eating all the wrong kinds of food, which is low calorie. <laughs> we were starting every day eating like uh, oatmeal. And yeah. uh, that's great unless you need a lot of calories and then it fills you up and you don't get them. So we had to yeah. switch our game plan on our on our eating. And uh, we ran into some other experienced hikers that kind of told us that we were we're heading down the wrong path there. So I had oatmeal every day, but I, I was sent some protein powder by my wife at the time and also some squeezy fruits, you know, kids squeezy fruit. All yeah. high cal- well, the protein powder was quite high calorie stuff, I believe, as well. It was just because I, I was losing catas- weight catastrophically. So I, I, <laughs> I needed to put, put more and more on. And what about um, meeting up with your wife, Alison, and other friends and family along the way? That was an important thing as well because they were, because Alison and your friends were helping with logistics, weren't they? Yes. Yeah. We had, um, you know, and I don't know if this went the same way for you or other hikers, but we had planned out to do a lot of food drops to try to minimize the amount of time we went into home and into, sure. into, into, into town. Yeah. And um, after time, we kind of did less and less of that. But yeah, so she was helping. Uh, she would send us like every week a food box uh, with oatmeal and, and other stuff. And um, then my family all uh, chipped in the same way, sending some goodie boxes from time to time. So, uh, yeah, they, uh, that really helped us get kind of started. And then once we kind of found our way and learned the ropes, we relied on that a little bit less. Right. Yeah. And if you ever did this again, I'm not saying you would, but, you know, who would be crazy enough to do it again other than me? Uh, <laughs> if you ever did it again, would you do it the same way? Would you still get friends to send stuff or would you cater for yourself along the way? Because I found catering for myself along the way was much easier. The reason being that because I got sent these big boxes of food and, and she always sent me much more than I wanted or right, needed. Right. So you're suddenly carrying 15 or 20 pounds extra because of all this big box of stuff you're getting. That's right. Yeah, I would say we do a lot less than that. I probably do some of it just for a treat once in a while. And, you know, that was another way for me to, you know, another motivating factor for me was, you know, writing this blog and, and trying to get as many people as I could kind of interested in my journey so yeah. that, you know, in my mind, I didn't want to let them down and not finish. And, you know, by them contributing by sending these packages, it also, you know, helped along with that whole concept of just having this, 
you know, people supporting me and have this team behind me that, that I didn't want to let down. Isn't that interesting? I, and you know what? It- and we sh- neither of us, neither of us should feel that way. I, I felt similarly, you know, with my podcast. I felt that people, not so much they relied upon me to carry on, but they wanted me to carry on. You know, you had that support. You feel like you really feel the need to do another podcast post in my case, or in your case, do another blog post, and you almost take on a responsibility, don't you, for for their vicarious entertainment, almost. Oh yeah, and I got a lot of feedback from people too. They really followed me and. Yeah, they were really cheering me on. So I, it definitely, um, it's definitely a factor. Now, unless you change these names, one of the your posts I read that you, your son was Bullet and you were Magnum. Right. Tell us, tell us how they came about. It was quite funny. Yeah. So, uh, like I mentioned, my son's in excellent condition. He could have run the whole trail if he wanted to, and um, he. Uh, I hate, he would, I hate it when people can do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so he would hike really fast, and um, in fact, most days. He had a hammock and I had a tent and uh, I would basically be awake whenever the sun came up and then I'd get up and go and, and he would be relaxing and sleeping in his hammock and comfortable and he might get up around, you know, nine o'clock or whatever. And <laughs> he'd blow by me at some point during the day. And so I would say, you know, if I saw people coming the other way, I'd say, Hey, did you see that little bullet go by? And, um, you know, and they always knew who I was talking about, you know, Oh yeah, yeah that, that guy in the green shirt, he was hiking really fast. <laughs> and so, I ran into one guy, and his uh, trail name was Rock Ocean. He was a very interesting fellow. Uh, he said, oh, that's going to be his trail name, Bullet. And if, since he's the bullet, then you're the magnum that shot him. So you're magnum. <laughs> so, you know, whenever somebody gives you a name like magnum, you don't turn that down. There's a Damn lot of right. you could get. <laughs> yeah, there's a whole lot. I've just been speaking, interviewing somebody about an hour ago called Sweat Bucket, which was fantastic. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, dear. It's funny. No. So I say I was interested in that list that you wrote, and it looks like, you know, you wrote this before you went, and it looks like you fulfilled all of those items on your list. But had you known what it was going to be like and say you were planning to go again, would you now add a few additional things to that list of what you'd be looking to achieve? Yeah, you know, I think one of the things that we did was go way too fast. My son decided he needed to be home earlier than what he had told me. That's the beginning right. of the hike. <laughs> and it basically cut a month off of what our plan was. Wow. And so um, we had to hike 20 miles a day the whole second half of the hike from up from Harper's Ferry uh, wow. to make his goal, uh, which we did. And I told him I would try. I wasn't sure I'd be able to do it or not. Uh, yeah. But um, Including New Hampshire, Maine? Yeah, yeah. That, that must have slowed you down, surely, because that's tough, we 20 were, miles. We were still hiking 20 miles a day right through the White Mountains. We really wow. did in Maine. Wow. Yeah. Even the day we did Mahusik Notch, I did 27 miles. So. Oh, my God. <laughs> First time we went through Mahusik Notch in 2014, it took us three hours. We had lunch in there. <laughs> oh, that's a great place. Is it? Yeah, you have a built-in refrigerator at the bottom there. Yeah, we, we managed to hike that fast. But, you know, I didn't, you know, I probably didn't enjoy it as much. And maybe we didn't take as much fun on some side trips as we would have otherwise. Right, right. I think that'd be, that'd be one thing. For me, I would I would want to explore something new and different. Um, having oh, really? AT, um, you know, I'd go out. I'd go out west somewhere and hike one of those long trails. Yeah, interesting. And so you didn't hike together most of the time, then, because he was fast. Did you meet up for meal stops and at night, and that was about it? Yeah, you know, there would even there would be go by days or even a week at a time when we wouldn't see each other. Oh, really? He might get ahead of me, or or he, I might get ahead of him. Yeah, we definitely we definitely didn't see each other every day. Oh, I didn't realize. That. Yeah, as a matter of fact, um, he basically had quit, you know, mentally uh, halfway through at Harper's Ferry when my wife came to meet us. Right. And he basically told me he wasn't going to continue. So I said, okay. And I took off. And um, then he decided, he changed his mind after a few days. And then he took off after me. And we basically met up about 500 miles later. So you know, that was wow. a quarter of the trail. We weren't, t- weren't really together. Wow. Did the trail strengthen your bond or, or, or was it a, a oh, yeah, strong already? It, it did. It did. Even definitely. though you weren't hiking, even though you weren't hiking together a lot of the time, it did still, it was a shared yeah, experience. We, we still have those shared experiences to look back on. And, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of stress <laughs> in hiking. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, if you meet, I don't know, how, you didn't sound like you ever hiked with someone you really knew. You just met people out in the trail. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it, you know, if you meet someone like that, then you've got a different relationship than someone that, you know, is really a close personal friend or, you know, relative. Absolutely. So 
you know, there's stresses and we would have uh, arguments from time to time, but at the end of the day, it, it really brought us closer for sure. And, yeah. uh, it was, it was a great experience to have. I wouldn't turn it down for anything. I'm sure. I'm sure. And, and I read about, cause as you, my problem is that when people give me a link, I always cyber stalk them. <laughs> I, re- <laughs> I, I read about various animal encounters you had, but spider bites seem to be the most that you worried about, you, you were most concerned at. Did that, who got bitten by a spider? Well, he did. And, um, he got bitten by a spider somewhere in New Hampshire. And actually mm. we weren't together at the time. And, and then we came together a little while later and he was st- starting to suffer. And then we were apart again and in, um, in Southern Maine, I finally caught up with him again. He was getting hives to the point where he couldn't sleep and uh, wow. swelling up. And wow. um, he was actually about to quit the trail, which we were only about 150 miles from being done. But uh, oh my gosh, he, he oh. was having such a hard time uh, that uh, he finally took some, you know, anti-inflammatory stuff, and he recovered. But uh, he was—it was that bad that he was almost ready to quit. Uh, but he didn't quit, did he? So no, he didn't. You, and I know you summited together. Tell us about your summit day because you really flew up Katahdin, didn't you? It took me about four hours to get up there. Okay, <laughs> took you only about five and a half hours to get up and down again, didn't it? Because it took yeah. me another five to get down. <laughs> well, we, <laughs> we w- one of the things the reason we went up so fast was it was a cloudy day. So we couldn't see anything. All right. So it wasn't like we were standing around, you know, taking pictures and looking and enjoying the view. So we were just were climbing. And I have to say that I find that Katahdin is, is the most worthy finish. It's just a spectacular way to end. It's the amazing. Hike. It's amazing, and isn't it? I hope, you know, there was some talk a few years ago about all the problems with hikers and maybe they'll move to Terminus. And boy, I hope that never happened because everyone Same deserves here. that opportunity to finish their hike that way. Yeah. But we just enjoyed it so much. It was so cool going up that thing with all the, you know, the rebar ladders and the boulder scrambling. And wow, it's just spectacular. So I don't know. Yes. We, just, we just really took it on. And you must have been really super, super fit by then. I mean, I was, I felt I was pretty fit by then, but uh, I was actually podcasting on the way up. So perhaps that slowed me down as well. Right. But, coming, but coming down, you mentioned you were nervous about your knees, but you, you flew down as well, didn't you? And I, I took a long time getting down. I found it much tougher to get down this time than I did first time. Yeah, we did go down pretty quickly, I guess. But again, it was the same, same thing. It was until we came off that kind of long incline on the top and got back into the boulder scramble area, it was still totally socked in. So we, we couldn't see anything, but we eventually did stop and take some pictures coming down. But right. I, uh, I really regret the fact that we didn't get a clear view off the top. Yeah. But you've got some beautiful pictures coming down. There's one particular one in, in your, in your blog of, of Carl, just holding onto a rock with the beautiful, the blue sky beyond him. It's a, right, it's a right. magnificent picture. And I know <laughs> I've mentioned before on the, on the show, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm jealous of people who finish the trail with their father, mother, sibling, or in fact, anybody they love. Because I know that I was so proud to finish the Camino in Spain with my niece, Emma, two years ago. What was that like, finishing that long journey with Carl? You know, what was it like for you? Well, you know, you have a great sense of personal accomplishment and pride, but also, you know, pride in your son that he was able to do that. And and, uh, he really handled himself in a great way. He got along well with everybody on the trail and everybody liked to you know, see and interact with him. And um, he came up with a lot of ingenious things uh, along the way to help make it go better. And he was really good at kind of adapting and uh, In what way? What, what, what modifying come up his with? equipment. And, I will see. I will see. Well, so- he, you know, he just continuously uh, modified, you know, his setup. He wound up around um, 12 pounds or something at the end. And he's probably started out with 18 to 20 as far as the base weight. Yeah. So uh, just being smart about, you know, how much clothing he needed. And he, he just got more and more minimalist as he went along. But it was working. so And it helped me, too, because I want, wound up dropping quite a sure. few pounds off my pack as well. Isn't it interesting how you realize the things you can live without? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and that was, again, one of my motivators starting out on the hike was, you know, is make a clean break, not just from work, but from all parts of life. And, you know, when you come back, you can kind of decide, you know, what goes back in and what you never needed. Yeah, isn't that interesting as well? Yeah, that's it. And I, the way you just said that, yeah, that I saw that the things you want to put back in and things you want to leave out, and I'm sure you can leave quite a few things out. Absolutely. And and in your recap, well, which I, I really liked your recap as well, you recognised the help that you received, and mainly you recognise, much as I do, that you need a big helping of luck to get to the end of one of these long distance oh, hikes. Yeah. Talk a bit about that. Well, 
I guess I kind of shuffle my feet, so I tripped a lot. And it's interesting now because when I go hiking, I don't hardly ever trip or fall down. But during this hike, I did a lot. And I, I think part of it is just having tired legs all the time and just not picking your feet up so much and stumbling. But I think I fell uh, 150, 200 times, something like that. I mean, that's a lot. And, well, I fell, uh, I fell 43, 45 times first time, 43 <laughs> times second time. Oh, I thought, you're counting. I thought I'd done pretty well. Yeah, I was counting every oh, yeah. single called out. I called out the number every single time. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, when you fall that many times, you know, your your number could come up any time. And, you know, I know uh, early on uh, there were a number of people, you know, left the trail with broken legs, you know, yeah. sl- slipping in a creek and kept catching their foot somewhere. And, yeah. and it happened to me too, slipping in a creek. But, you know, I never uh, – slipped in the right way to, to really hurt myself. But that's, you know, that's, that's, and you can get sick to the point where you just can't continue. So there are a lot of things that can befall you out of the trail or something can happen at home that uh, requires your, you know, attention and you just have to, you just have to leave. But, you know, we, so we were lucky that a lot of those things never occurred to us. And one thing that I hadn't really considered before, you said that you tended to stay in your tent or in your son's case's hammock away from the shelters and that, and you felt, and your feeling was that a lot of people picked up sickness and stuff uh, in shelters. Oh, there's no question about that. I mean, it, it comes in waves, right? I mean, sometimes it's not a problem, but sometimes, you know, there's a lot of people that are sick. And so yeah. Uh, yeah. I think you're just, um, your odds are better if you don't go into the shelter. I know a lot of people do and they don't have a problem, but I, I, I tend to avoid them. Also, there's always people snoring in there and yeah. uh, I can't sleep when people are snoring around me. So I wasn't going to get I've much got my sleep. hand up. I've got my hand up right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was me. That would have been me. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you finished and you returned home to, was it Ohio at the time? Yes. Yeah, and and then you moved to North Carolina, but you, that was nothing to do with wanting to be part of the of the club, I presume. But you joined the Carolina Mountain Club in Asheville. What was your role when you joined, and, and what is it now? What is your what does your time at the club involve? So you know, anyone that you know comes out to work with the club, what they would generally be doing is joining one of the crews, and uh-huh. um, so you're just a worker beyond the crew when you start out. Uh-huh. Uh, our club has responsibility for 94 miles of the Appalachian Trail and then 150 miles of the Mountain to Sea Trail and another 150 miles of other trails oh, in western wow. North Carolina. Wow. So We've got a lot we're looking after about 450 miles of trails. Wow. So it's a, it's a lot of responsibility. Well, thank you for uh, that have, straight away. Yeah, we have quite a few crews. Um, so we have crews, uh, two on Monday, one on Wednesday, one on Thursday, two on Friday, uh, four Saturdays a year, and some overnight crews and special events. So uh, we're out there a lot. And... Uh, as you mentioned, my buddy Tom, he um, he's working on the Friday crew in Asheville, and mm-hmm. he was as soon as as soon as I moved to North Carolina, of course he he helped me do that as well. Uh, as far as you know, looking for places to live, and um, you know he kept inviting me out. And I was busy with my house and moving and everything for a while, but then uh, I came out and joined the Friday crew. What do, what do you get out of it then? Tell us what 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 it does for you. Well, there's there's so much that you get out of it. You know, you, when you start out. Uh, you do it because you want to give back. That's that's the main reason anyone would would start out doing that. Sure. But uh, so much more of it evolves over time. You know, you get the opportunity to work outside and spend a day in the woods, and that's always great. Uh, you learn new skills, how to do different trail maintenance techniques. You know, the main thing is there's a camaraderie among the crews and the and all the trail workers. Uh, it's fun to do because you're out with a group and sure. everybody's kind of kidding around. Uh, it's also a real group of professional people. So they're dedicated and they're hardworking. You know, we have a lot of engineers. We have college professors. Oh, uh, wow. People from wow. all walks of life, they're out there um, and, you know, having a second career, so to speak. Uh, you get instant gratification. So, you know, so a lot of different kinds of volunteer work you may do that might take, you know, months or years to see a result. But when you go out on the trail, you know, you see the trails in a certain condition and need some yes. help. And, you got there and you work. At the end of the day, the trail looks great, and so yeah. you know, bam, one day feedback. It's right there. It's there's amazing. all sorts of all sorts of great reasons to, to go out and work on the trails. What is a day, or even a couple of days? You, you do many overnighters. Yeah, we've started a, a new thing where we are uh, broadcasting two events a year right. that are on the AT, and so it appeals to people that backpack. So we'll backpack into a location carrying our tools, and then we'll work from there for the weekend. Oh, nice. Uh, and that's been really great because um, it gets a whole different group of people involved than, than what we typically see because, you know, the crews that work during the week, necessarily it's a lot of retired people. But um, on the sure. weekends, you can get all 
age ranges. Uh, we always get parents out there with kids that have come. We get people from all over the country that come because they see it advertised on the ATC website. Right. We actually had people from Florida, from Arizona, from Indiana come on these work weekends. So it's really an outstanding uh, uh, new adventure that we're out, off on here. Now tell us, what does it look like? So you 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 hike in, you each each carry a tool, I presume, and your, and your tent yeah. or whatever it is you take with you. You right. get you establish a base camp, I presume. Is that by a shelter or not? It can be. Uh, the main thing is that we need to have water or be close yeah. to the cars where we can have water in the car. But, um, right. yeah, so, you know, it starts off with we have to figure out where we want to work. So we pick a, a location that gets less attention. Typically, the crews, you know, they'll park at a trailhead and they'll walk in a mile or so and they'll work there. So for this activity, we want to go in a little farther to so get sure. places the crews don't normally reach. So then we'll, you know, scout out the work. We'll decide how many work zones are going to be, how many work leaders group work leaders we need, what kind of tools are going to be required. And then we get that all together. And then, you know, once the people uh, sign up, we know how many we have, we put them up into groups. And then, uh, you know, we give them, each of them an assignment to go out and it might be, might be uh, clearing roots off the trail. It might be putting in steps, might be um, blazing the trail or doing lopping, uh, might be redigging the trail uh, to get back to the three foot width. And there's just a lot of different things that we, we get involved with. Yeah, I, I can imagine that instant gratification. You know, I've been through when people are working on the trail, and sadly, they're all people my age, you know, 66, 67, right. that sort of age. And, yeah. and that's a bit of a problem. And I know that, um, oh, actually, before I ask that question, I'll ask you something else, I suppose. How are you funded for the tools and whatever else you need to go in there? Well, there's a couple of ways. Uh, we have a budget, our club, you know, collected dues. So there is a, a fairly meager budget every year uh, that we can have to spend on any kind of trail maintenance activities. Um, and then we're probably more of our main funding is trying to get grants. Right. So I've written a grant this year for the uh, North Carolina license plate tag, and they gave us $4,500 to buy tools. So that's nice. That's one way we do that. And REI has got a grant program now and LL Bean. So there's different... Um, different places that we can go for money uh, for stuff like that. That's cool. That's cool. It's, a, it's an amazing thing. It's, and funny, I, I didn't, I don't know if it's because through hikers were coming through, but I didn't see as many crews out there as I, I thought I kind of might see when I went last year, but I could always tell when somebody had been, when a crew had just been there, it did look so pristine that right. they, 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 they'd done. You know, we were all always very grateful for, for that as well. So, and Tom referred in his email to me to some creative ideas for recruiting younger members, which of course is critical to the continued success of the trial. How have you gone about that, getting younger members involved? Well, I think that what I mentioned, that overnight crew on the weekend is one big vehicle for doing that. Uh, another right. is that uh, ATC will post any of our events online that are involving with the AT. So uh, we've been doing that and um, we have been getting uh, some younger people out, some you know, people that are just going off to college or people that are on summer break or maybe they got a day off of work. They've been coming out uh, with us. So it's, um, yeah, it's nice to have that mix because yeah. uh, we do enjoy each other's company. But uh, anytime you get someone new involved, it's just fun to have them and get their different perspectives and, yeah, you know, keep your toe into uh, what's going on in the real world out there a little bit. <laughs> I can I can, ima- I can imagine it's a bit like a, a through or even a, or a section hiker where where you just run into people, don't you? Whose whose motivation to be out there is um, they're all different. They've all got a different story, but there seems to be a mutual respect of hikers when they're out on the trail, isn't there? Yes, absolutely. And I'll tell you, everyone that comes out has a good time. I, I guess I can't remember a single person. It didn't enjoy them their time out there. Now, sometimes the work has been a bit too hard, not so much for the younger people, but sometimes for some of the older people, it's a bit too sure. hard, sure. which I understand, but uh, everyone always has a good time. All right. Well, look, here's your chance to pitch people to join your club or, of course, their local club, whichever it may be. Have at it, you know. Um, would you uh, Do you have a little uh, elevator pitch you put out there to people why they'd like, they might want to join your club? Well, you know, our club is is um, actually older than the Appalachian Trail. It was fun, founded in 1923. So uh, oh. it's been around for a long time, and we helped build the trail, as a matter of fact, yeah. uh, through this cool. area. So, uh, you know, the club is, is also primarily a hiking club. So I think there's about 1,100 members, and um, uh, we have maybe 175 that are actively involved in the trail maintenance side of things. So, oh. you know, if you want to join the Carolina Mountain Club and you're interested in hiking – 
that's a great way to do it. They, you get to see all sorts of trails all over the area, uh, all over the region, I should say, that uh, you might not go to on your own. And with people that are experienced, they can lead the hikes. Yes. So that's, a, that's a great reason. And then if you want to give back on the trail maintenance side, as I said, we've got almost every day of the week covered uh, when you can go out. Uh, you can also become a section maintainer, which means you don't have to go out with a crew. You can go out anytime you want and work on your particular section. Sure. Our uh, Appalachian Trail is divided into 32 sections, and um, uh, we've got about 56 maintainers out there that are doing that actively. So there's all sorts of different ways you can do it. You can uh, adapt it to your schedule. And uh, then if you want to come out with the crew, I think that's the best way because uh, it's so much fun and you're going to learn so much. And, you're, and you'll be taught how to use different uh, machinery, I presume. not machinery, but various different implements, I presume. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You start out with the real basic hand tools. And we do actually have some machines for drills and such things for certain jobs. But, uh, yeah. yeah, you absolutely will be under someone's tutelage. Uh, uh, you'll have a mentor out there who will watch over you and make sure you work safely. And uh, we have a really good record of uh, – of not you know getting people hurt so it's a safe <laughs> a safe job i mean there are some dangers involved in it but uh we do it safely and um it's so enjoyable and you'll learn new things and meet new people and um they might be your lifelong friends that's cool well look thank you so much for coming on i'm so glad that um tom wrote to me about you the fact that you've combined um your love of hiking with your after work life and you wrote so so beautifully about it i thought i really enjoyed reading a lot of your blog today and if you, with your permission i'll put that in the show notes as well because i think it's worth looking at so people can understand what it takes to do through hike and um i really appreciate you coming on the show oh i appreciate you having me steve and give me an opportunity to talk a little bit about our club not at all you, you without you guys we would have, we wouldn't have a trial so oh actually before we yeah, we're running more, an experiment on that right now yeah I, I was about to say i was about to say what is happening on the trail right now, that, as far as you know? Do you, do you as a maintainer still go out there, or are you seeing? No, we're, we're not allowed. We're not right. allowed out. Right. We haven't been allowed so, out for about a month. And uh, like I say, we're running an experiment right now on what, what is life without maintainers. I hope it doesn't go on too long because it's just yeah. going to make our work uh, much tougher when we go back out to, to get I'm going sure. again. And I'm wondering what the wildlife is doing out there. And what, because I, I heard I heard this morning that uh, in Yellowstone National Park, the bear population has multiplied four times, wow. which is extraordinary. <laughs> yeah. it, it, it probably more means that they're coming out and being seen as opposed yeah. to not being seen. I'd imagine there's quite a few animals out there who are going to be really pissed off when people come back into the woods. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, you know, nature will reclaim things. So uh, that's right. trails and very being quickly. reclaimed right now. I that's think right. my prediction is, It'll never last this long, but I think in a couple of years, a lot of trail sections would be would be impassable. Wow, amazing! Well, thanks. Well, as I say, thanks so much for the work you do. We really appreciate it. All right, Steve. Thank you. Take it easy. Bye. Bye. I love that. Paul said, "You decide what goes back in and what you never needed." That realisation, that moment that you understand that your life can be far less complicated is a very powerful thing. And believe me, going on a long distance hike soon sorts out what you need from what you want. And isn't that a lot of trail that they look after? I was shocked. And I wonder what the trail is going to look like when it opens up again. The maintainers are invaluable to the hiking community at all times. And I'm sure that we all wish Paul and his colleagues well as they go back to the trail and open it up for us eventually. Now it is Clay Bonham and Evans. Clay's on today to tell you about a trail that he's personally very interested in and after listening to him, I'm sure that several of you will be as well. Here's Clay. I'd like to bring on a friend of both the show and me because this time last year, Clay Bonham and Evans, or Pony, came to hike with me for three days on the Appalachian Trail. Hey Clay, how are you? Uh, doing all right, all things considered. All things considered, indeed, yeah. Um, and this is my first actual interview from my closet. I am indeed back in the closet. He's in the closet, folks. There you go. So can you believe it was a year ago that we did that? It's incredible, isn't it? It is incredible. And, you know, the, the big trauma from last year was the terrible murder. Sure. And now, I mean, here we are a year later, and there's hardly anybody even out there. So it's yeah. you never know, right? 
You never know. You're absolutely right. Yeah. I mean, it was great fun. I really enjoyed uh, hanging out with you for three days. And and I know that you were, we're going to talk about this uh, Great Plains Trail today. And I know you were quite a, a proponent of the Great Plains Trail, but it was only this morning that I discovered you're actually on the board of the Great Plains Trail Alliance. How did you come to learn about this trail and get involved? Uh, 2018 Backpacker Magazine did a little story. I was, you know, I live in Colorado part of the year and a guy who lived at that time in Longmont, right near where I'm from, they did an interview with him. And he he sort of looked like a Don Quixote almost, just tilting at this crazy windmill of trying to start a trail from Texas to the Canadian border in North Dakota. And is that, the funny enough, when I was looking at it this morning, people, it read as if it's a north to south trail, not a south to north trail. Is that normally the way to do it? Well, the... Only one person that we're aware of has actually done it. And let's be honest, it's more of a route at this point than it is a trail. The trail has to kind of find its way into being. But Luke Strider Jordan, who's a kind of a well-known guy, he is the only person that we're aware of, and he did it south to north. Right. Oh, okay. That's that's interesting. So let's get, first of all, let's get the facts and figures out of the way. First, how how long is it? How many miles is it supposed to be when it's from beginning to the end? So... The interesting thing is, as I say, it's a route. So what Steve Myers, the guy who is the 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 guy behind it, and he's been at this for about a decade, you know, he's tried to route it as much as he can on public lands, on trails where he can, but obviously a lot of it's road walking at this point. Given that, the mileage isn't that long. I think when Luke did it, it was about 2,100 miles. But it's significant. I mean, it's not just a walk in a boat. Oh, it's no. It's yeah, quite yeah. a ways. Uh, so, right. so in terms of is there any idea of how percent in percentage terms how long this is and when it's expected to be complete well you know i mean one of the reasons when steve asked me if i would join the board i decided to was just because you know i think there's no guarantee that it will be complete and i right. wanted to get in there and see what can you do what does it take how does this happen so you know uh it's been a long slow effort mostly steve but we do have a board now no way to predict and and he's just this is his baby and he's always refining and taking trips to you know relocate on public lands and so who knows really yeah yeah it's it's funny actually i think it's a wonderful testament to america and americans that they want another long distance trail and it could even become the fourth leg in the triple crown <laughs> as it were uh, or, you know it could be a quadruple crown so you've done some of it you've done about 300 miles of the of the route have you so far yeah so what the board before I joined decided to kind of really push, try to get out in the public is what they're calling the pilot trail. It goes uh, from Bear Butte outside Sturgis, South Dakota, right. uh, down to Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. Right. And I did, a, that's about 350 miles or so. It, it depends. There are some variations. I did about 300 miles of that in August and September. All right. And, and how high does it get? You know, the highest it gets is uh, about 5,800 feet, I think it is, in the Black Hills of South Dakota. Right. Well, that's an area I could do then because, as you know, I can't do the, the elevation. So that, that certainly sounds interesting to me. And, and it's supposed to be a multi-use trail when it's when it, theoretically going to be done, isn't it? In much the same way the PCT is. Yeah. Steve's drawn out routes for bicycles too. And in all honesty, it's a more bikeable route right now than it is a hikeable route. And that has to do with the distance between public lands where you can set up a tent and water and all those things. Now, I will just tell you, I went Sobo. So I started at Bear Butte, just outside Sturgis, South Dakota. And the first 125 miles or so of this trail are actually on the Centennial Trail, which is a very nice trail through the Black Hills. Nice. Yeah, it's great. Very doable. And what does it, and I'm sure you know what I mean by this, what does it feel like as a trail? Because you've been on the AT, uh, you've done a number of different trails. Um, is there a, is there a feeling to it yet, or does it just feel like a, a place where people go walking? You know what the AT feels like, in other words? Absolutely. What it felt felt like to me was being all alone on a 300-mile trail walk. Uh, it is it, it, The Centennial Trail is a great trail. I saw not one backpack. Uh, so it's the kind of thing, if you're looking for a really kind of unique, you know, solitary experience, it's ideal. I mean, I loved it. 
I wouldn't want to do it for 2000 miles personally, right. Right. but for 300 miles. And, and I did have some people, some media people join me at the end, but it, it's very solitary. And also I would just say the Centennial Trails, mostly a real trail. It feels like a trail if you're hiking the foothills of Colorado. Once you get out of there, you are going across what I basically ended up thinking of as the great Nebraska savanna. And it is wide open and you're not going to find many trees. It was it was like it was the most extreme experience hiking I've ever had. Why wow, I'd imagine as well, yeah. It's a bit like um like those old cowboy movies, isn't it? Is it like the the big sky? <laughs> you see things like that. Yeah. I, I would imagine it must be lovely to do. So I presume there's not a trail culture yet or anything like that, that obviously. What about resupplies? Through the through the the Centennial Trail and the Black Hills resupply, there are several opportunities and several that you can take. You can go to Mount Rushmore where I took a side trip so I could eat in the cafeteria, you know, have a big <laughs> Coke and some yeah. Yan- Yankee pot roast. So that resupply is pretty great. Once you get out of the Black Hills, you are looking at long walks between, you know, it depends on how you look at it, but probably between 25 and 30 miles just to get between places where you're actually allowed to camp. Wow. And then, you know, There are little bitty towns where I did a resupply, but, you know, between Edgemont, South Dakota and Crawford, Nebraska, my next, and there was nothing in between there. I mean, it's just, (laughs) it's just hardly even see a car, you know, you got to carry your own stuff and you got to be thinking about water and would have been okay for me water wise, but Steve Myers, he was traveling around with Luke who has done the trail they were scouting some routes and they actually stashed some water for me. Turned out I didn't need it, but I was glad to have it. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. So what is it? You went in, you say September, August, September time. Yeah, I went, I went about, I think I started August 20th or 21st or something like that. It took me eh, two and a half weeks. The last few days were slower because I had a public radio, uh, Omaha public radio reporter with me, but it was great, great fun to actually have company after nearly two weeks of like, None. You're happy to be by yourself, though, aren't you, on a trail? You're very, yeah. you're, you're very comfortable out there, aren't you? I am very comfortable. But you know what? When I get to town, when I get to the shelter, when I get to the campground, I'm a chatterbox. You remember, I, I, I you know, I, really? I, I can go. <laughs> I can. And so, but I'm also, I have that capacity to just go 8, 10, 12 hours a day. It was quite unique, honestly, to be hiking days on end without talking to anyone. I mean, that's, um, I, I haven't had that experience on any trail. No, I couldn't. I can't imagine you have. No, I, actually, I think that soli- the solitude will probably put me off a little bit too much. That is, that is a lot of hundred mile wildernesses, isn't it? Really, and literally by yourself as well. So I, I would find that tricky. What about? Is there any unusual wildlife out there, or any great wildlife to see? Yeah, it's it's great plain. So so the Black Hills are this little hump of mountains that were formed at the same time as the Rocky Mountains. So it's like a foothills environment there. And the best thing that you get to see in the Black Hills uh, are bison. Because once you get into Custer State Park and Wind Cave National Park, there are huge herds of bison. And I'll tell you, I got a I had a very spooky experience one night hearing a bison approaching my little tent off by myself somewhere. And I tell you, that thing sounded like if there were such a thing as an ogre, that's what he sounded like. And I was like oh man, <laughs> boy, but that's the best thing. And, you know, once you get really out into the kind of the, the high plains, you're going to see antelope, you're going to see coyotes. I saw no snakes, but I guess there are rattlesnakes out there. I saw yeah. amazing frogs, surviving in a tiny little pool at 98 degrees in the middle of nowhere. So it's, you know, I'd say the bison are the biggest thing. So if somebody wanted to try this out, what would you say a good section, say of 100 miles would be? Is it the Centennial Trail itself, do you think? I think it totally depends on what you're looking for. If you're looking for a mostly, asterisk, well-marked trail that is a trail uh, that has potential resupply spots. You know, I'd say that 125 mile Centennial Trail, that is a great trail. Uh, as a beginner trail, now, if you don't want to be by yourself, bring a buddy, but uh, it, it's a great trail. Now, if you want a taste of both that and sort of what I'm calling the Great Savannah, you know, you could do, you, you could pop in halfway through Centennial Trail and then 
hike down to Edgemont, South Dakota. And if you want the extreme experience, you're going to go <laughs> from Edgemont, South Dakota to Crawford, Nebraska. Now, I, I, I took some wrong turns there, but I ended up hiking. Oh, I don't know. It was it was more than 75 miles over three days in 90 something degree heat. It was insane. Wow. Yeah, it was crazy. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't like that either. <laughs> yeah. And, well, and I got sunburned and I, I, it was, you know, it sounds terrible, but I loved it, but it was, it was not an easy thing to do. Yeah. For sure. yeah. yeah. So how can people learn more about this in clay? So I'm going to, I'm going to suggest two things. You can go to greatplainstrail.org and that is the organization. It's a pretty modest website. If people really want an in-depth writerly uh, view of this, I've got a fairly long uh, blog on my website, which is claybonnymanevans.com. You'll see it in the header, Great Plains Trail, and you can just click there. And it's got, I think, episodes, 18 episodes. And it's it's a lot of detail of step-by-step step what I did and what I skipped Ooh. too. Yeah. Cool. Well, what I'll do then, I'll put in the show notes both those links. And uh, if people are more interested, I'd love to see if anybody else has actually been on this trail as well. So uh, thanks for coming on talking to us about it. You bet. And and I guess I should say people can always email me as well. I've actually gotten some emails from people. I, I wrote about it for the trek, the Centennial Trail. So sure. Clay Bonnyman at Gmail if they want to email. Okay, buddy. Well, lo- love you. Talk to you. And uh, we'll, ca- we'll catch up again soon next time I go for another long hike. All right. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks, Steve. Take it easy. Bye. All right. Bye. That sounds like quite something, doesn't it? Not sure I'll be around long enough to see it completed, but it's another great indication of the amazing bounty that America possesses. Check out Clay's links in the show notes. The past few months, I've been reminding you all that this show isn't free for me to put on, and many of you have responded really generously by donating to the show through the donation button on the MightyBlueOnTheAT.com website at the podcast page, and I am so grateful for that. This week, though, I wanted to point you in another direction to somewhere that you can also help out by buying a Hiking Radio Network t-shirt or performance shirt for the hiker in your life. Just go to hikingradionetwork.com and click on the Cool Merch tab. Thank you so much. Finally today, Grandma Gatewood crosses the Hudson River and continues her strange transition from grandmother to hiking superstar. I'll see you next week. Chapter 9. Good Hard Life. July the 27th to August the 2nd, 1955. Just south of the hard scrabble river city of Port Jervis, New York, she turned south and snaked along the state line, the low and fertile black dirt region to her east, until the trail turned north near Greenwood Lake, New York, then back to the east, toward the Palisades Interstate Park, 40 miles north of Manhattan, and the millions of people rushing about in the city. At Lake Mombasha, she met a man and two women, and two children who were going for a swim. The man said the lake was private property before starting up the trail. Emma followed them, talking about the trail and chattering about her walk until the man grew interested. She pulled from a bag a few of the newspaper clippings she had collected and was shown the man when a woman walked up and introduced herself as Mary Snow. Emma wasn't able to reach her on Monday or Tuesday when she called, so she was surprised to see Snow waiting. They chatted a while and made plans to meet a few hours later where the trail crossed Route 17, which carried white-knuckled tourists from the city to the Catskill Mountains and back. Snow then said goodbye. Emma started walking and came to a steep and dangerous rock scramble surging skyward called Agony Grind, known to make grown men say embarrassing things. Emma, on a bum leg, would later write in a diary that it was a pretty hard and rocky piece of trail. When she reached Route 17, Snow was waiting with the police officer's wife. They drove together to the officer's house for lunch, then back to the trail, where Emma and her new acquaintance started walking. They talked along the way, with Snow asking question after question. Emma told her she'd carefully avoided snakes and other critters. She talked about eating plants and berries, sustenance she found along the trail, and about relying on the charity of strangers. She mentioned that she'd met both nice and miserable people. She seemed serenely confident that she'd make it to Maine. She told Snow something else. When she stood on top of Mount Katahdin, if she made it to the top of Mount Katahdin, she planned to do something special. 
The trail was smooth and easy, and after five miles they reached a new stone shelter on Fingerboard Mountain. Snow told Emma she'd meet her the next morning at 9.30 on Bear Mountain, a few miles away, hard against the Hudson River. There were two boys at the shelter, which was built atop a huge boulder. It had a tin roof and fireplaces at both ends, and it was filthy. Emma decided to sleep outside instead, and she found a nice grassy spot on which to spread her blanket. The boys moved down behind a large rock in some leaves. Emma felt raindrops in the night, so she grabbed her bag and scrambled through the dark to the shelter. She turned a flashlight on for the boys, who seemed content to sleep in the rain. She needed rest, though. She had to be up early to make it to Bear Mountain on time, and the climb ahead would be rough. Emma returned from California to a financial mess. PC had mismanaged the farm in her absence. They had no money to pay the mortgage and could not find a way to appease the creditors. In 1938, they had to let the farm go. They bought the smaller George Sheets farm up the river from Crown City, Ohio, and moved in on May the 30th, but they would be gone by the following year. Something had gotten into PC. He would not let Emma out of his sight. He refused to work unless she came along, whether it was building fences or pounding rock or cutting wood. Occasionally, Emma would slip a few sandwiches into a paper bag and take her two young daughters into the woods to hunt for wildflowers. They'd walk over hills and into valleys all day long, identifying bloodroot and windflowers, bluets and buttercups and trilliums. On one of their flower hunts near Possum Hollow, a gentle rain was falling, washing the woodlands, and they found a large moss-covered boulder protruding from the earth, covered with delicate hepaticus. It was a sight they'd never forget. Emma would later write that her husband beat her beyond recognition ten times that year. The reporters gathered early near the observatory on Bear Mountain on July the 28th, a bevy of them with Mary Snow of Sports Illustrated, to wait for Grandma Emma Gatewood, who would be arriving at 9.30am. Ten o'clock passed, then eleven, then noon, and there was no sign yet of Emma. The newspapermen and photographers began to peel away, one by one, disappointed and a bit worried about the old woman. Mary Snow held out, but ventured down the mountain for lunch. Emma had walked as hard as she could to make it on time, but the section of trail was steep and her injury made the climb difficult. She caught up with a group of hikers, though, and asked them how far she was from Bear Mountain. Seven miles, one of them said. They pointed to a peak on the horizon, and off she went. By the time she arrived at the top, four hours late, all the reporters had gone. Mary Snow and a tall policeman soon arrived and the policeman took photographs of Emma, hand on a hip, a green eye shade pulled down over her nut-brown forehead, her sack slung over her left shoulder. A few tourists noticed and began snapping a picture as well. When the policeman was finished, Emma headed down the mountain and Snow met her in a car at the bottom and took her to a restaurant. That night, Snow paid for a cabin in Fort Montgomery on the west bank of the Hudson. Emma said goodbye, then washed her clothes and dried them by a fire and fell asleep. She had tried to find a map but had no luck, so the next morning at 6am she walked back to where Snow had fetched her and found the nearest white blaze and followed it toward the Bear Mountain Bridge, an impressive suspension bridge of steel and concrete, completed 31 years before. She noticed the railroad tracks running underneath the automobile lanes. She had never dreamed she would get to walk across the Hudson River on a bridge, but step by step she went as cars blurred by. She stopped in the middle, suspended between the water and the sky to behold the sights. Downriver was New York City, and to the north was the United States Military Academy at West Point, where monuments to dead soldiers dotted the manicured grounds. It was here, during the Revolutionary War, that colonists stretched a giant chain across the Hudson to stop British ships from travelling upriver. Across the bridge, she walked over swampy but level ground and stumbled onto a Girl Scout camp about 8am. The campers were still sleeping, so Emma routed them out from their beds. They'd intended to get up early to break camp. She pressed on and slept that night on a pile of leaves near the trail. She left again at 5.30am, thirsty and looking for water, and walked until she heard the gurgle of a stream. Following the sound, she found a new well, but the water flowing was muddy. She approached the house nearby and a woman kindly filled a canteen and offered Emma breakfast. Farther down the trail, near Stormville, New York, in the Fishkill Mountains, she came to something called the Lost Village. It appeared to be a museum, so she wandered in. The Lost Village had been open just two months, and its proprietors had recently made the controversial claim that the American cowboy had originated there, a short commute from New York City, despite the legends of the West. 
Two city dwellers had found the place several years before on a weekend trip upstate to look for land. They discovered several stone foundations and various pieces of pottery and iron catalysts, and after reviewing some historical maps, decided to campaign publicly that the original cowboys were British cattle thieves who raided rich Dutch settlers from a lawless encampment on the mountain. It helped that the husband was a publicist and the wife a writer. The newspapers ran stories. The proprietors charged admission at the door. Emma didn't dispute the claims. She looked around, then left, and jotted her feelings later in her diary. Some things there were fakes, I am sure, she wrote. As the sun set July the 30th, she followed a side trail to the Luddington Girl Scout camp near Holmes, New York, the village from which the first through hiker Earl V. Schaefer had mailed his groundbreaking letter to the Appalachian Trail Conference. Emma introduced herself. The councillors asked her to stay, and after dinner they parked Emma in front of the fireplace and sat the girls at her feet, little ones in the front. She told them story after story about her trip. When she was finished, all the girls wanted her autograph. In a shaky hand, Emma signed every scrap of paper. She slept on a cot in a tent that night, and the kitchen staff sent her away early the next morning with a full belly, a sack lunch for the trail, and a handful of bouillon cubes. She hiked the next day past Nuclear Lake and over Burton Brook and Swamp River and made it to another Girl Scout camp in Wingdale, New York, by nightfall, and again enjoyed the company and the dinner of steamed brown bread and celery. On the 1st day of August, she left New York and entered Connecticut, the ninth state in which she'd planted her sneakers. She wanted to make it 20 miles up the Housatonic River to Cornwall Bridge, Connecticut, before dark, but despite walking hard all day, she hadn't reached town when the sky went black. As she was hoofing down the shoulder of a gravel mountain road, a car stopped beside her, and a man with booze-hazed eyes looked her over. "'Why in the world are you walking in such a place after nightfall?' he asked. She told him she was trying to make it to town before dark. "'Get in,' he said in a demanding tone. "'I'll take you to my sister's a half a mile down the road.' She hesitated. She wasn't sure she trusted him. "'Get on in here,' he said. "'You can't get to Cornwall Bridge tonight.' She did as he said, but she wasn't sure it was wise. His appearance was dulled, and Emma was pretty sure he was full of strong drink, but he did what he promised. The man's sister, Mrs Charles Moore, wouldn't hear of Emma going any farther that night. Emma woke early and walked back to where the man had picked her up, then came to the moors for breakfast. She came this far without skipping a single step of the trail and she wasn't about to start cheating. She hiked the five miles into Cornwall Bridge and poked into the post office to see if she had any mail. She didn't. She called the home of Patrick Hare, a local man she had met at Shenandoah National Park, but no one answered. She ate dinner at the home of Mrs Clarence Blake, a correspondent for the local newspaper. The story in the Waterbury Republican ran the following day, as Emma followed the trail along a picturesque ravine, past clear waterfalls and under a tall hemlock canopy that excluded most of the sunlight, then through a plateau of giant boulders and into the majestic cathedral pines, an old-growth white pine and hemlock forest with trees reaching more than 100 feet into the sky. Great-grandmother guns along, the headline read. Blake noted that Emma had worn out three pairs of shoes and had lost 24 pounds in the three months she'd been walking. Even the beginning of the hike was done on a spur-of-the-moment basis. Mrs Gatewood just started out equipped with a canteen, a 25-foot pack and some spending money, the article read. Mrs Gatewood has had no special training as a hiker except for the good hard life of raising her 11 children on a farm in Ohio. The article spoke of a determination and how she had established a pace of about 17 miles per day, rain or shine. The shine part was easy.